All right, well, hello everyone. This is Rebecca Dallin. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Stormwater Quality here at the City of Oklahoma City. I would like to officially welcome everyone to the October edition of our 2023 bi-monthly webinar series. We will begin the main presentation momentarily, so I want to provide some information to help enhance everyone's experience during today's program. In order to reduce background noise, we ask that everyone keep themselves muted during the presentation. If anyone has any questions, feel free to type those into chat. We will be monitoring chat for questions today and have our guest speaker answer as many questions as we have time for. If anyone would like to receive a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, please send our community relations coordinator, Holly Thorne, an email to request it, and I'll put her email address into chat. Everyone turn on your cameras and wave to Holly <laughs> or not. <laughs> All right, thank you, Holly, for taking that over today. Um, each of the presentations in this webinar series will be available within a week or so after the scheduled webinar date on our website under Stormwater Workshops. And the section where these webinars are posted, of course, it will be called the webinar series and today's session is the October edition. We will post a link to that website where you can find those presentations toward the end of today's program. If anyone has any questions at this time, feel free to type them into chat. But without further ado, I will play the very short webinar series welcome presentation. Good afternoon and welcome to our bi-monthly stormwater quality webinar series. We always enjoy providing opportunities for everyone to learn how to help keep our local waterways clean. Remember, we're all downstream from someone else, so we all need to work together to protect our waterways. This year's series has had several great presentations. You've had the opportunity to hear from some of our own stormwater quality staff as well as select guest speakers. We do have one more session in December, so be sure to tune in. As we've briefly mentioned, each of the presentations should be available online within a week or so after the presentation is aired live. The links will be posted on the workshop section of our stormwater quality website. We'll put a direct link to that page into chat toward the end of today's program. If you haven't signed up already, please do so now by pointing your phone's camera at the QR codes for the newsletter that you're interested in. The only way to sign up for either the construction or industrial training and education newsletters is via a direct website link or these QR codes. These options are both hidden in the email service site GovDelivery. These two newsletters are the main way that we announce upcoming training, webinars, and workshops, so be sure to sign up. The quarterly newsletter is the third QR code, and it provides overall information about what we're up to. You can find this one on the Gov Delivery website. If you miss any of these codes, be sure to send Rebecca an email and she'll send you the direct website links. We also have an excellent Lunch and Learn series and the registration announcements will be sent through those newsletters. Some of our presentations will be live and some will be pre-recorded. We do our best to provide as much detailed, accurate information as possible while also working with the presenters' strengths and their schedule. We live and work in a beautiful community here in Oklahoma City. For more information about stormwater, what we're up to, and local regulations, be sure to visit our website. All right, up next is the main presentation for today's webinar. Today we're going to hear from Dr. Jamie Schussler from Oklahoma State University. Sorry, we were just talking about the pronunciation of her last name because there's a dentist in Stillwater that my daughter went to, so it's confusing. Anyway, Dr. Schussler joined the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Oklahoma State University as an assistant professor in August of 2022. Prior to her appointment at OSU, she received received her doctorate in civil engineering from Auburn University in Alabama. Her research focuses on stormwater management, specializing in erosion and sediment control. Her work aims to find implementable solutions to manage increased stormwater runoff and sediment loads from construction, urban, agricultural, and reclamation sites. With that, um, Jamie, please share your screen and take it away. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I am working on that share right now. Okay, so is that thumbs up? We can see my screen. 
Yep, we got it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you so much for having me today. I'm super excited to present uh, this specific presentation called We Can Settle It. We'll be talking about flocculent for sediment control during construction. So my group here at Oklahoma State University, we focus on stormwater management um, during and post-development. Now, I got my start, I was just speaking with Wayne, I got my start in stormwater at Iowa State and continued that uh, the study of stormwater in my doctorate at Auburn University. I'm really excited now to be at Oklahoma State in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering um, and to be having such a great lab group with uh, awesome students who make this research possible. So before we start, I just want to say a huge thank you to having me from the city of Oklahoma City. I really appreciate the support I received from you all and also the invitations to speak and just share some of what we're we're learning through research here. I also want to make sure that I acknowledge Auburn because a lot of what I'll be presenting today is from the research projects I worked on at Auburn with a special thanks to um, my colleague at that time, Dr. Belur Kazaz, who has now gone on to work for Geosyntech, but um, she also provided some material for today's presentation. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, and then some of the research findings I will be presenting today came from work that we did for the Iowa Department of Transportation and the Alabama Department of Transportation. So just a lot of people who helped contribute to today's presentation. So I like to start by sharing why I personally care about our water resources. I think that's an important part to tell our water story. And so for me, water impacts every part of my life. Um, I've always really loved being around or in or on the water. And so that was a big factor in why I chose to study it and study it for a very long time. Um, so we are big fisher people in my family. It doesn't matter what kind, but um, grew up bass fishing. We lived down by the coast for a while, got into some salt water. So there's a picture there too. But we love hiking and we have a golden retriever, Max. Um, he's on the Pete's Pet Posse here at OSU. But when he's not working, we cannot keep this guy out of the water. And so that's really important to me that our water quality is high enough that, you know, my dog Max isn't going to get sick. I have my little niece, May, who's three and just loves to swim. So water and water quality impacts a lot of areas of my life and what I enjoy. I also always ask my students to look into what watershed they're from and share that. It creates a little bit of responsibility there. And so for me, I'm from Milton, West Virginia, which is in the Lower Guyan Dot watershed. So I mentioned that I spent a lot of time studying stormwater and I was really on the construction side of things all through my master's um, and most of my PhD as well. And so looking at this, this was from my very first site visit. And it just really showed me that in construction, we have to be really responsible with the way that we manage the sites and the stormwater on site, because we know that earthwork uh, can really strip away the vegetation um, and the stabilization, which accelerates the erosion and downstream sedimentation processes. And once the sediment gets into the waters, we see a lot of downstream effects. So this was actually a farm pond that was uh, right next to a highway construction site that I was working on with the Iowa DOT. And as you can see, there's a lot of controls put in place in this inflow channel, but we still look at the color of that water and it's pretty muddy going into that pond. And we ended up having to dredge out uh, no matter how many controls we put right there. And so some of these effects is just what I was describing, that color. We have that increased siltation and turbidity, and eventually that's going to affect our aquatic habitats um, and really stress those aquatic habitats in the water. Now, once this all drops out from suspension, and now we have a bunch of sediment sitting within our conveyance channels, well, we've taken up some storage now with that sediment. And so we see reduced capacities and that might lead to flooding. Of course, if this is your pond, you're probably not gonna be too happy about the color of water coming in there. Um, and like I said, we ended up dredging out that pond quite a few times. 
And then if this continues and our surface waters um, become really impaired with this sediment, well, then there's going to be some extra money and energy that goes into water treatment. And speaking on the erosion side of things, if we're losing all of that soil, especially in Iowa, where it was a really nutrient rich soil, we're losing that into our waterways, well, the creation of soil, it takes a really, really long time. And so looking at all of these things, you know, I started to realize, well, erosion and sediment control is going to be hugely important during construction. And just talking about the cost of erosion in the U.S. Now, this estimate was from 1995. And to mitigate the impact of erosion, it cost over $45 billion. Now, I know how inflation has hit me and my groceries, so I can only imagine how it's hitting this number as well. So we're putting a lot of resources into this. And so making sure that we do it responsibly and smartly is really, really important. So we talked about a lot of the problems and what are we doing about it? Well, we know for construction activities that are going to, to disturb more than one acre, um, we need to get a stormwater permit. Uh, so here in Oklahoma, that's the OKR 10. Um, and with that, we have a stormwater pollution prevention plan. Now, that stormwater pollution prevention plan, or as I lovingly call it, a SWIP, uh, is going to include the design, installation, and maintenance of all of our erosion and sediment control practices. In 2023, the Oklahoma DEQ had recorded more than 1,700 OKR 10 permits that were active for at least some portion um, of 2023. Now, I talked about some of those practices that were going to be in place. Um, now we have things like ditch checks and perimeter controls and even sediment basins. And so even on a site that was had a lot of management practices, we're still producing runoff that looks like this. Why, if we're doing our best management practices, do we still have runoff of this color? Well, what happens is that those practices are really good at holding up um, and getting our coarsest particles to, to stay on site. But when we have these really fine colloidal silts and clay particles, once they're suspended in the water column, they're so small, it takes a really long time to settle these out. And so a lot of times, especially with the clay particles, the detention time that's needed to settle these particles from suspension really exceed what's practicable for our BMPs. So what else can we do? We just looked at some pictures of sites that have a lot of practices and we're still having this sort of very turbid water entering our surface waters. And so that's what I'm gonna talk to you today about this magical white powder um, that we call flocculant. Um, and so if we look at it in this way, it comes in a lot of different forms. This first one being the granular form. That's the powder that I'm showing you on the screen. So this granular flocculant. It also comes in these kind of large soap um, looking things. And those are what we call flocculant blocks or flock blocks for short. We see them in sock form. So really that sock is stuffed with this granular flocculant, but the sock helps the application a bit. And then we have some emulsion forms or a liquid um, form with flocculant in there. Now, a lot of times when I mention flocculant, people say, oh yeah, we know about flocculant. It's in water treatment. And we can look at that right here. So we see some coagulants are added. We have a flash mix to really activate that. And then it goes into this flocculation tank. Now, one thing I want to point out that from the flocculation tank, it goes into a sedimentation tank. And that's to allow those flocks to settle from suspension. And we're really going to talk about similar principles with that in stormwater today. So flocculants, we could talk about flocculants and the types and um, all kinds all day long if we wanted to. So just showing you just how many types of flocculants are available. 
but we are really going to be focused here in the synthetic flocculants, which is primarily polyacrylamide. Now, if people are using a flocculant on a construction site, it's pretty safe to assume that it's probably a polyacrylamide or a PAM product. Now, there are some exceptions to this, but mostly um, it's going to be the polyacrylamide, and so that's where I'm focusing this presentation today. Now, polyacrylamide, that sounds like a really big word um, and maybe a little bit scary, but really this has been used in a lot of applications. It's been used as a feed thickener in paper and pulp production, in cosmetics, um, even in our food industry as a clarifier. And then of course, that water and wastewater treatment that I mentioned a few slides ago. Since about the 90s, we've been looking at polyacrylamide in erosion and sediment control applications. Um, we use it as a soil conditioner. It's in some of our hydro seeding to help stabilize that soil while we get vegetation to establish. Um, we can use it in demucking, uh, even in dust control. So if we mix in some flocculant uh, with, our, with our water tanks out there, we might see that um, flocculant helps with the dust control and that soil stabilization then. And then up in this channel, we're introducing flocculants, and that's primarily going to be to clear up that turbidity. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So flocculants can really help us improve the soil capture on site uh, and reduce the turbidity that's being discharged to our surface waters. Now, it's really important that we pay attention to this caveat that flocculants must be properly matched, dosed, and activated to provide the benefits that I'm talking about. There are several different applications in construction stormwater. We have what we call an active system, and that's the picture shown here. This active system requires some sort of mechanical pumping and a power source. So we think if it's active, we're going to need some sort of energy to go into this system. Now, with passive systems, it's a little bit different. We're going to be introducing flocculant in the line of flow. So that flow is going to be moving gravitationally rather than needing that mechanical pumping. So that's going to be the two big differences between active and passive. Now, a lot of times when you were using active systems, that's because we have a problem and we really need to treat it fast. With passive systems, we can put that in place and be very proactive about it. Um, we just need to make sure that if we're using flocculant, that we are dosing it responsibly and at the proper rates. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that today. So we'll be talking about polyacrylamide and passive systems. So we've narrowed it down just a bit now. Um, now, when we're using these passive systems, one important thing is that our runoff, our sediment laden, very turbid runoff is going to have the adequate contact in mixing time with that flocculant. So the runoff here is going to flow over these flocculant or these little soap blocks here. Um, and then it's going to have some time in that channel to really mix in and incorporate. Now this flow should be directed to some sort of detention based practice so that we have some um, time and storage for that sedimentation to occur. Just like that sedimentation tank that I showed you in the water treatment system. So what do flocculants do? Well, they increase the sedimentation rate of these really fine particles. And the way that they do that is they get the, they are able to put in a charge into the water that attracts these really fine clay particles to stick together. And so you can see an up close in this top picture that our really fine clays have now become much larger. And when they're suspended in the water column, they're able to gravitate gravitationally settle much more rapidly. And how is that? It's by introducing a molecular charge. So I have to give us something, you know, pretty technical here, throw at least one equation into the, to the presentation. Um, and that's just talking about particle settling, and it's governed by what we call Stokes law. And so just one thing I wanna point out here in this equation is that we have the velocity of settling. And here in the uh, numerator, we have d squared, which is represents the particle diameter. 
So if we increase the particle diameter, we are going to be able to increase the rate of settling. And that's what flocculant helps us do. Well, how does it increase that diameter? We introduce the molecular charge that's going to be oppositely charged as our sediment to pull those all together. So positive and negative. Now, I mentioned earlier that it's really, really important that we match our soil and our flocculent type. And the way that we do that is through jar testing. And that's something you see here. So we would take our site soil, put it in a jar with some water, and then put in various different types of flocculant. We might even dose that differently. Um, so by dose, I mean put in different concentrations of that flocculant to see what would be appropriate. And we look at various different parameters. Um, in research, we put a lot of numbers to this. Uh, in the industry, a lot of times we're gonna do a jar test, we'll shake it up, let it settle for a minute and see which flocculant performed best with our soil. In research, we have this little scheme um, that we look at color, flock, for, flock formation time, um, flock formation size, and then the settling rate. And so all of this helps us decrease our turbidity. Um, I think we're pretty familiar with that term, but if not, turbidity is the cloudiness or haziness of a water. And it's like golf, lower turbidity is better. Now. Right now, we don't have numeric turbidity limits on construction sites unless you're in a really sensitive area. But flocculent might be the key to really helping us achieve a lower turbidity or a turbidity threshold. So if I'm telling you how great and how magical this flocculent is, are people using it? Maybe why don't we know as much about it? In 2020, my friend Buller conducted a survey nationwide to see who was using flocculants. She surveyed all of the DOTs in the U.S. And the reason we use the DOT is because a lot of times they're the major facilitator of construction within the state. And she found that less than half of DOTs are actually using flocculants on their construction site. And we said, well, why? Why not? Um, there were a lot of uncertainties about the risks that are posed to receiving waters. And so you're probably saying, well, are there environmental risks? And I told you all at the beginning, I'm a big fisher person, so I don't want to see anything that looks like this. And so in short, we have anionic PAM that's negatively charged and cationic PAM that's positively charged. While both have their place and can be used with proper dosing, we see that anionic PAM is generally going to be just a lot safer. Um, why, you might ask? Well, cationic polyacrylamide can also um, bind with the fish gills and cause suffocation, whereas anionic PAM is the same charge as most of our fish, and so that is going to repel each other. Therefore, anionic PAM is, is pretty safe for our aquatic habitats. And just so you're not hearing it only from me, I've shared a few quotes on flocculants here. And so here's one from the Office of Water that it says, although cationic polymers are effective flocculants and do reduce turbidity, their positive charges make them toxic to aquatic organisms when dissolved in water. Consequently, they should not be used as flocculants in stormwater that runs off the land into natural water bodies. However, anionic polymers, which carry a negative charge, are not toxic. Um, here below, we see a quote from the USDA that says, essentially, uh, polyacrylamide is going to be far less toxic to our receiving waters than fungicides, insecticides, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of work in this area that shows, well, anionic uh, polyacrylamide could be a really safe option that helps us uh, decrease that turbidity. And that's another thing that I just wanna hit on is if we have sustained turbidity in our waters, um, turbidity that is not natural to that surface water, well, that can also be pretty toxic to our aquatic life. 
especially anything that's a site feeder like a bass. If we have turbidity, they're not able to feed. If we have sedimentation occurring, well, then we're affecting some spawning habitats. Um, and also we might not be able to get that nice uh, plant establishment, those aquatic plant establishments. So there are also um, effects of turbidity that we need to consider. And so there are trade-offs when we start talking about this. Now, the US EPA within the construction general permit also allows anionic flocculant and coagulant. Um, for example, anionic polyacrylamide. And so this is allowed to be used as within the stormwater pollution prevention plans as an erosion and sediment control. However, if cationic chemicals are used, that's going to require additional permitting. Okay. And so we talked earlier about active and passive application techniques, and I told you that I'm going to focus this presentation on passive application techniques. There's a few different ways you can do this. Um, again, we have the flocculent blocks and we have this granular polyacrylamide that we can see in the bottom corner um, that's applied to some sort of ditch check. In the lower left, you can see one of those socks I mentioned. And then also sometimes we stick some flocculent within a conveyance pipe as well. And that's what that top right picture is showing. Rebecca, do you still have me connected? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, oops, okay. Apologize for this. And so this was just going to talk about, this next piece was going to talk about um, the application rate of of polyacrylamide in stormwater to be effective. And so we really don't need very much to really have quite a profound effect on the turbidity. And so we can see here now that it's working, I hope. Yes, that we only need about 0.5 to 1% um, concentration in water. Or we can think about this numerically, about one pound of flocculant per 100 gallons of water. Yes, Rebecca? Um, if, if you've changed your slides, we have not seen a change in the slides. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, technology sometimes. How about... Now, do we have at least oh, words I see, on the slide? I see the words at the bottom now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for that. Okay. So we can think about applying about one pound of polyacrylamide for every 100 gallons of water we need to treat. Um, another common question that we get is going to be what is the cost of this? And it's about $6 per pound. Um, when we're talking about flocculent blocks, it's about $100 a block, um, but the blocks treat, say, 800,000 gallons of water. So the blocks are also a very affordable way to do it. Now, I've talked some about um, how it increases settling velocity. And so that's what this slide is showing some videos. This is a water column um, that has no flocculant in it. So just sediment laden water, we're putting it here um, in the column so you can see. Now we look at about 1% flocculant and how it really drastically increases that settling velocity with 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%. And 30%. And so we can see there's actually a sweet spot here. And so obviously we still have soil suspended in this water column. With 1%, we've settled out a lot, but we still have um, some turbidity in that effluent water column. Five, maybe a little bit of color, but really here in 10 and 20, we're looking pretty clear. 
well, what happens over here? We might have a little bit more color in 30%. And this picture right here shows you that more isn't always better. There really is a sweet spot with this flocculant. It doesn't take a lot to really rapidly increase that settling velocity. Now, that's what I'm talking about with responsible dosing. If we overdose, what happens is that the water actually becomes can become more viscous and it can decrease the settling velocity. And so that's why we still see some particles suspended over here in the column. So really in that 10 to 20 percent, we're seeing a sweet spot. Oh, and that was it all at the same time. So we can see just how quickly um, we're able to settle out that sediment. So I want to talk just briefly about a project that we did with flocculent blocks. In the construction industry, when people are using flocculant, they're pretty positive about the flocculent blocks. Why? Because it's just as I said, you put a flocculent block out, one block, it degrades pretty uniformly to dose. Um, and it treats 800,000 gallons of water. So you can put it out there and it lasts a while. Whereas you might need to check on those ditch check practices with granular form after every storm event. So the blocks are a really attractive option just because they need a little bit less attention once they're out in the field. So we did some controlled testing in an inflow channel that flowed into a sediment basin. This is what the testing apparatus looked like. It had a geotextile liner. We had a small four bay. And then at the end, it was a skimmer dewatering mechanism. Um, I do another presentation to talk all about the effectiveness of these specific elements in a sediment basin. But this talk, we're going to be focusing just on these flocculent blocks. And so this image here is showing flocculent flats. Um, they were provided to us by Carolina Hydrologic. There's a lot of places that you can get flocculent blocks. Um, but one block here treated 800,000 gallons of stormwater. We put three across the channel, and that was so that our flow could evenly flow over top of those across the whole width of the channel um, because our channel was just so much wider. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we had this little regimen to match flocculent types and our soil type. And so this picture to the right kind of depicts exactly what we were looking at. We had a soil type and we looked at several different flocculants and some were sort, certainly more efficient with our soil type than others. So if you try one flocculant and you're not seeing any change in turbidity, it just might not be the right match. And so you keep trying. Now, if you're thinking about using flocculant on your site and you're like, well, how do I do this match testing? A lot of times the uh, flocculant manufacturers will just have you send a small sample of your site soil. Um, so that would be what we call a dry sample or even a grab sample of some um, discharge water. And they'll do the matching for you and let you know which product or which flocculant type um, is the best match for you. Um, and so ours was, we made sure that this block form was going to work. And as I said, we had three laid across our channel, and that was just to make sure all of our flow was coming into contact. So the blocks were here in between these stakes. We just had them staked down to the channel. And the flow was going over each um, of those blocks. And so that's what we call the contact time. At this point, the sediment laden stormwater is coming into contact with those flocculent blocks. And then we have some pretty uh, turbid conditions here to help with that mixing. And that continued in the inflow channel. Now, on this left hand side, I'm showing you the sedimentation that occurred without flocculant in place. And so I want you to use some of these cinder blocks as metric points. Um, so we have some sedimentation that occurred, but if we look over on this right side, that's when we used flocculant. One, our sedimentation, you can tell it's much coarser and just look how much further back that sedimentation profile goes. So we can see just how much sediment we really were capturing visually. Of course, in research, we need to quantify everything. And so um, without flocculant, we were capturing 96% of our sediment introduced, which was pretty good. We had the system down pretty well at this point. 
wanted to see what flocculant would add. And we increased to 98% sediment retention. Now, when I say this, people say, well, that's only 2%. Is it really worth it? We have to think of the size particles that we're capturing. We're capturing those finest, finest clays. And so those aren't going to have as much weight as how we were quantifying here as maybe those sands. And so that 2% has quite a profound difference when we start talking turbidity and how quickly we can get our turbidity down. Now, without going too far into the weeds about the testing here, um, we had a 30 minute filling period followed by some settling uh, time before we filled the basin again. Um, but the pink line represents the basin, uh, the turbidity leaving the basin when no flocculant was used. The green line represents the turbidity when flocculant was used. So even as flow was coming in and discharging from the basin, we start seeing discharge around 20 minutes, the basin filled. And that turbidity is somewhere around 250 NTU. But very quickly, um, inflow stops, and then we start to see this really quick settling happen. So just around 40 minutes, so we filled for the first 30 minutes. Now at 40 minutes, we've had 10 minutes of um, you know, just de detention time with no new inflow we've dropped to just around 100 NTU. And so we've dropped around 100 NTU very, very quickly. Um, and so we see that it just keeps falling. And really by the end of 48 hours, we were sitting around 25 NTU, which is pretty clear looking water. Um, so really good coming from a sediment basin especially considering that a lot of times our turbidity coming into a sediment basin is in the tens of thousands of NTU. The other thing that we looked at was the size of the soil particles we were capturing when flocculant was used. The dotted lines here represent the size particles when flocculant was used. The biggest takeaway here is that we see the dotted lines generally shift toward our zero axis. That's indicating to us that we're capturing much smaller particles than we would without flocculant, which is represented by these solids lines. And the um, particle sizes that we were capturing was half the size of what we were capturing without flocculant. So really flocculant gave us that opportunity to get those really fine clays out of the water. So the quick conclusions on this portion of the research was that flocculant improved turbidity reduction by 42%. And our particles that we were capturing were half the size than we were able without flocculant. This flocculant increased our settling rate. As I told you, we were able to get below that 100 NTU very, very quickly. So it raises a question here. Well, if we're able to settle particles from suspension that quickly, do we need to design basins that have these very long extended detention times? Because if our basins don't need as long of detention times, we can drastically decrease the footprint of these basins for similar water quality treatment. And if you're in an area that has a turbidity limit, a numeric limit, then flocculant could be a really important tool for you to be able to reach that threshold. Another thing that we looked at was just assessing that environmental impact and what were the concentrations of flocculant leaving the basin? Well, when we looked at the residual concentrations of polyacrylamide that would be discharged, it was about six milligrams per liter. Um, if we look at any safety data sheet, they were testing all the way up to 30 and 35 milligrams per liter. Even at those limits, we were not seeing any aquatic effects. And so six milligrams per liter was well within that safe range. So that was a lot of the work we've done previously. 
moving forward, we're going to be looking at the efficiency and longevity of flocculent blocks. Um, I have an awesome undergraduate research assistant, Victoria, who received a scholarship here through the College of Engineering to do some work with flocculants. And we're going to be focusing really um, on these flocculent blocks and looking at them and seeing what sort of longevity do they have? What maintenance needs are there um, under various maintenance conditions? Do they perform differently? Because we really want to be able to provide good design guidance and tools if we are going to be introducing this into our stormwater pollution prevention plants. So I want to leave you with some final thoughts um, and just want to make sure I'm hitting these home that flocculent is going to be very soil specific. Our jar testing is absolutely a necessary component um, and our anionic flocculants are going to be generally much safer to use and discharge from our sites. Flocculants can do their best work if we reduce our coarse sediment loading prior to flocculent treatment. For example, if we can put in some sort of forebay um, or some sort of practice upstream that allows those sand particles to settle out very quickly, then what our sediment laden flow introduced to our flocculant really just has those finest particles. We can make sure that there's that proper contact in mixing time. Flocculant does have a short activation period. What does that mean? Well, with these blocks, they need to get wet to be able to release any of the product. So we want to make sure that those blocks are activated and clear of sediment. Um, the flock blocks, I'm going to go back just one slide. Here on the bottom right, uh, this is a flocculent block that it did its job in one event. Um, but we can see after the practice dewatered, there was a lot of sedimentation on top. Well, now if that dries and it cakes, the next flow cannot come in contact with that block. So it's really important um, that we keep these blocks wet and clear of sediment. Um, we want some sort of high flow or mixing situation. That's a really important part to make sure that flocculant is activated and well incorporated into our stormwater runoff. Um, and so that's this point saying that we need to create some turbulence or some sort of agitation after the introduction of flocculant. And then we should direct any of this flow um, to some sort of practice that will allow time for sedimentation or settling to occur on site, not off site. Because again, we want to capture all of that material on site so that it's not reaching our surface waters. A question I get quite a bit is, OK, we've captured this um, sediment in our basins. Our basins are filling up much quicker. They say that like it's a problem, but that's what we want to see. We want to see that our basins are really capturing that sediment. And we go, when we go in and we dredge out or clean out those basins, I'll get, well, what can we do with this material? We can take that material and apply it back on site. As I mentioned earlier, we use flocculant in a lot of our hydro seeding or soil stabilization our vegetation will still establish on this soil. So you can just reapply it right back on your site. Now, this sign that I have here is a little bit of a joke, but I do want to say that flocculent can get very, very slippery when wet. So if you're working or introducing this within the channel environment, you are going to get um, quite a bit of slickness there. So it's very important that you're careful when handling these sorts of things. Um, really no sorts of toxicity upon touch. Um, I haven't tried eating it, but um, I know it's in some of our food products. So, you know, everything is important to just do it responsibly. Um, but with that, I think we have some time for questions. I really appreciate everyone coming today to hear about flocculent. I'm very pumped up about this and, um, you know, a pathway forward for our stormwater pollution prevention plan. So I'm more than happy to talk about it. OK, great. Thank you so much. And um, we don't have any questions in chat, but I would like to invite um, people to do so if you if you'd like to type your question in. Looks like we do have a couple people with their hands raised. Uh, do you mind taking some live questions? 
Yeah, I'm happy to. Okay. Uh, we'll start with Matthew. Matthew, did you want to ask a question? Feel free to unmute. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, the question I had is, how long does this stuff take to break down naturally? Like, after how? it's after it's activated, how long does it stay sure. in the system? Okay. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, I have not done any studies or read any studies to look at, at how long it's going to take um, to break down. Now, we do know that it does stay within that soil. That's why it's really important if we're going to do some sort of application that we do so back on site. Um, and I'll just say anecdotally from my uh, research with sediment basins, we waited to apply flocculant to the very end because we know that we're going to have some effect that that flocculant does stay within the soil. Um, now, that is something that we've thought quite a bit about to, to do moving forward, um, looking at how long it takes to break down, um, what sorts of concentrations, so more the fate and transport. But I don't have a direct answer for you, just some of those anecdotes, but hopefully um, I can share that in some future presentations. Cool. Thank you, Matthew. And it looks like we have a question from Gary. Can we use the NRCS texture classification when considering flocculant? Yeah. Okay, that's a really good question, but unfortunately, I'm going to tell you, my answer is unfortunately no. It's going to depend more on um, soil chemistry than it is on soil texture. And so we know that Yes, it's going to work very well on clay soils to get them um, to, to bond, but we need to know what the charge of that um, soil is. So it gets a little bit more complicated than that. So that's why we leave it um, to the experts. It's really, it's, it's easy and quick, and typically the manufacturers will do it for free if you just send them a quick sample. Um, let them take care of the soil chemistry part of it. We have looked at some, um, if there's any soil chemists out there, you probably know a lot more than me. Um, we have looked at some cationic exchange capacities of soil. So if you know that, um, we might be able to match you with flocculant a little bit better than just with soil texture. All right. And a question from Wayne. Are there limits on storm scope and duration that would overwhelm the block arrangement? Yeah, sure. That's a really good question. Um, so really, it's not as much about a volume as it's going to be that appropriate contact and mixing time. So if you have some stormwater that comes into contact with that block, but you have enough mixing and agitation going on, we are going to see some treatment with this flocculant. Um, and it's like I said, even if you don't get that full dose. Um, we looked at the video that I will just go back on, but even with, at, the lower, um, at the lower concentrations, we are still getting that uh, settling to occur. So comparatively to a zero, even with a really small dosage percentage, we're still seeing much more rapid, um, much more rapid, uh, settling occurring. So I would say, sure, you might not get the same turbidities you're getting in a smaller storm, but it's still going to provide you some benefit. Excellent. Thank you. Um, again, if anyone has any additional questions for Jamie, she'll be hanging out here for just a few more minutes. Um, but thank you so much. Um, and what a great presentation. Thank you, Jamie, that was fantastic. Um, as a reminder, if anyone would like to receive a certificate of attendance, uh, we've got more questions, or no, I don't, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, if anyone would like to receive a certificate of attendance for today's presentation, please send those emails to Holly Thorne. We ask you uh, that you don't request the certificates in chat because we may not have your email address linked to your username on Teams. I did just pop her email into chat again for everyone. And then I've also mentioned that a recording of today's presentation will be available on our website uh, soon, as soon as uh, we're able to get that uploaded. 
and I'm, we're dependent on, on a couple people to be able to get that done. So I can't say exactly when it'll be uh, uploaded, but it should be within a week or so, hopefully. And then in chat is the link to that website. Uh, we do have another question from Wayne. He says, is ODOT ready to do some test or pilot projects? Yeah, so thanks for that question, Wayne. Um, I've talked quite a bit um, with Catherine down at ODOT. And so, you know, I'm just still, I would say, getting started here and my research program started here. But I've been really, really thankful for those conversations with them. We've definitely talked about flocculent. Um, so hopefully something will come out of that. But we will be doing some flocculent testing here at the university at the bench scale. Um, and we would love to have, you know, find some sites to do it larger scale as well. Other places are doing it. I can share, I can certainly share some case studies from, from other states and construction sites if you're interested. Um, and I'm going to put my email in the chat box as well, just in case we have any questions after this presentation. So thank you all so much. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for attending today's session. We hope everyone enjoyed the presentation um, and are continuing to enjoy our webinar series. We hope to see you again on December 14th at 2 p.m. for the next installment in our bi-monthly webinar series. Then we'll be hearing from Jeff King with American Excelsior, and his presentation is entitled An Environmentally Friendly Alternative to Silt Fence. So that'll be interesting to hear. Uh, so we hope everyone can tune in again in December. Have a great afternoon. And again, if anyone has any more questions for Jamie, I think she can hang out here for a few more minutes and we'll just keep an eye on chat. Or if you want to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to do that as soon as we get the recording stopped. All right. Thanks again, everyone.